the state government and the residuary powers in our constitution is left with the federal government whereas in American constitution where is the states that's beautiful that means you know you are recognizing the autonomy of the state the American constitution allows secession right no can the state claim the power to secede no there are certain constitutions which recognize even the power of secession. So, these are questions which are fundamental, which you will be reading in the constitution. Indian constitution does not recognize it. That's why no politician in India can negotiate with Pakistan on the basis that you are going to cede the territory in Jammu and Kashmir. You can read. Uh, you can uh, negotiate it only within the framework of the constitution. Okay. There are certain fundamental rights in the Indian constitution like your bill of rights. We have only six. We do not have in the constitution right to property as a fundamental right. It is not a guaranteed right. And if you want to look at Indian constitutional history, you may, must read few cases which I hope Prasad will refer to tomorrow, under which the right to property which was part of Indian citizens' fundamental right was taken out and made into an ordinary legal right and not a constitutional right. And there is a history behind it. That is a, a war between the judiciary and the legislature has happened in the first 25 years of our freedom. When land was... Uh, um, you know, the zamindari was abolished and land reform had taken place. These were challenged in the court and the court said you cannot acquire the private land without paying uh, market compensation. The state, state said no, that was not what was intended. Constitution was amended when the court said no, this is what is intended. And the state said we can't afford to pay all the zamindars whom Br the British created money now, we don't have the money and this was not what was thought about when the constitution was made. So there was difference of opinion on, on what conditions can you acquire private property and ultimately the parliament by an amendment of the constitution threw out right to property out of bill of rights. So this is a great lesson of constitutional law which you have to understand that unless it bears some relation to the social revolution that the constitution want to bring about in a society which was unequal, exploitative, where entire property, this was, this happened in South Africa. 80% of the land in South Africa, particularly cultivable land, were in the hands of the whites. And only 13%, uh, I mean, uh, whites who are 13%. 13% having 80% of land and 80% of people having 13% of land. So this sort of a disparity had to be changed when apartheid ended. And the entire constitutional jurisprudence they evolved. Is this after all constitution is to serve the people. It is not a, a document which has to be literally interpreted according to Oxford Dictionary. Constitutional interpretation is to be related to justice, social justice. And that is where the challenge of a student of law and uh, arises. Anyway, we have certain rights which are social economic rights which could not be included like the, 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 the International uh, Convention on Civil and Political Rights and Convention on Social and Economic Rights. Now, we were a desperately poor country at the time we won independence. So the right to food, the right to employment, the right to housing could not be guaranteed as a fundamental right like right to liberty, equality, freedom, etc. So therefore we followed the convention, universal convention of civil political rights enforceable through court and the social economic rights enforceable through legislative depending upon the resources available to the state. What happened was that in this scheme of things, education was denied to people, housing was denied to people, 
So the rich continue to be rich, the poor continue to be poor, which cannot be operated in an egalitarian social order. So we had to make certain new initiatives, legislative initiatives, whereby the social and economic rights were made enforceable. And this is an exciting uh, story of Indian constitutional law as to how uh, child rights, women's rights, disabled rights and the rights of poor people got some recognition in the matter of allocating resources of the state. And that was made possible both by legislative intervention as well as constitutional interpretation. And this makes constitutional law a very interesting subject for study and it is still growing. I consider a constitution as a living thing with a body, a mind and an intellect. And the mind of the constitution, the soul of the constitution so to say, is the fundamental rights, the directive principles of state policy the preamble to the constitution and we have a chapter on fundamental duties of citizens. So these uh, form the soul of the constitution and the rest of the body. The body can be amputated as human beings still can live with amputated surgery and all that. Similarly, constitutional amendments with respect to the body parts doesn't make much difference. That can be done. But you cannot touch the soul. The soul cannot be changed, then the character of the constitution itself will be demolished and you will be doing something demo, uh, against the spirit of the constitution. I say this because the issue came up before the Indian Supreme Court. Whether you can continue to do the way that you have done by take, throwing away the right to property. The Supreme Court said no. The parliament it sits as a constituent assembly to amend the constitution, exercising its constituent powers, is exercising the powers given to it by the constitution. So you cannot exceed the powers given to the constitution. And if you exceed and change the constitution, then you are disregarding the constitution. You are using powers outside the constitution. So the Supreme Court came out with the theory that there are certain basic features of the constitution which no parliament can ever amend. If at all it has to be amended, there are only two ways. One is a revolution, where the constitution itself is thrown out. We didn't have it, though our neighbors had several times. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, all had changed several times, but India did not change. The other method which is suggested, though it is not constitutionally mentioned, is a referendum. Let an issue which the constitution considers as a basic feature, say for example, federalism, fundamental rights, parliamentary democracy, democracy, secularism. These are basic features. So if tomorrow, let us say the Hindu Mahasabha gets elected, out of uh, 560 members of parliament, they got 550. Can they change India into a Hindu Rashtra? No. Under the present constitution, it cannot be done. In the, India can only remain a secular state. And I must uh, tell you in this connection, this is some part of history, though I am little exaggerating. You know, when India was partitioned, the conditions, I suppose some of you know about the story. India was partitioned, it was partitioned on the basis of religion, on the basis of Hindu, Muslim. And Muslims were given the option to vote for a separate state if they so desire. And many of them voted for a separate state and they created Pakistan. Hindus, some of them voted to go to Pakistan, but many voted in favor of remaining in India. And surprisingly, many Muslims voted in favor of remaining in India rather than going into Islamic Republic of Pakistan. 
so much so today india is the second largest muslim country in the world after indonesia after indonesia now this is something that is why because we chose secularism we said no we do not want to create they decided to be an islamic republic but india has been a secular republic for several thousand years and we continue to remain so and to assure that muslims will have nothing to fear in a hindu dominant india we have provided in fundamental rights some rights called minority rights they are available only for minorities that is why the majority party here the the bjp they say that hindus in india are second class citizens because the minorities here have more rights than what the majority has but if you know history why was this given because it is natural for a minority like muslims living in a hindu dominated india to be afraid of what will happen to their religion their traditions etc so to guarantee that this will not be affected we want to give constitutional guarantees minority rights were incorporated so this is very important as to the importance of minority rights in indian constitution as fundamental rights not just this is judicially enforceable parliament cannot change it this is very important to highlight in our constitutional scheme sir. yes sir uh, as you said that india is a secular uh, country ah. but uh, there is something maybe it is very surprise for me because there is some kind of the political parties ah. which has a, a religious uh, background yes sir like PGP, as you i said. got it yes so how uh-huh. is it that yeah that is a, you know our concept of secularism is not exactly the european concept of separation of politics from religion our concept is equality among all religions number one the state not declaring to be a religious state number one the state cannot be declared to be a religious state so secular state number two all religions will be treated equally it does not bar a religious group forming a political party so we have all india muslim league which is in power in kerala so it is there is no difficult but you cannot appeal to vote on the basis of religion that is prohibited under the election law so but but you can choose suppose you are in a constituency where there are muslims in majority then you will choose your party candidate from amongst muslims this is natural so that is played and moreover there is because the religious society is religion was so much dominating you cannot divorce mahatma gandhi in all his political speeches st- st- started off with prayers hindu prayers and things like that and for him religion will purify politics true religion so therefore divorcing religion from politics is making politics valueless this is perspective but how far it is practiced is a different story madam by people the constitution says india or bharat these are the only hindustan and um, hindu rashtra these are all some people take it media plays it up and things like that otherwise india and, or bharat both can be used under the well this is a big story i would have loved to speak on secularism in india but it will take away the time yeah. and if you are interested maybe we will find some time for that let me just move on to the one thing which we have borrowed from the american jurisprudence and it has helped us a great deal is what is called due process our constitution when it was adopted in article 21 we adopted you know we were warned by american judges the the constitution makers went and met them 
and the constitution makers were told please don't incorporate due process in your constitution it will create a lot of headache war between the so they were warned and we did not incorporate those people were impressed by the advice given by the americans and we did not incorporate it but later on what happened what was incorporated was that life and liberty cannot be taken away except according to procedure established by law that means without the authority of the law you shall not take that by and large it means substantive due process but the supreme court has said that no it involves procedural due process also any law cannot be passed so that you know you want to uh, detain a person indefinitely preventively or otherwise so you passed a law no terrorist should be allowed to come out of jail if parliament passed a law can it be there the supreme court said no if that law is unjust unreasonable unfair it cannot stand the test of article 21 so by interpretation the supreme court changed the procedure established by law as due process of law and in full bloom they have decided subsequent cases and the whole history of due process jurisprudence is part of indian constitutional law thanks to the american courts all right we have in this country the judicial system very quickly we have 30 judges in the supreme court all of them are not in place now including the uh, the chief justice and they don't sit and block as america here we have two judges three judges five judges different benches depending upon the gravity of the case the chief justice form the bench benches so these 30 judges sit as uh, 10 different courts and some of them may give different opinions some conflicting also is possible that is why uh, one writer uh, has written indian supreme court is not one court but 10 different courts because they might interpret the constitution differently in different benches in which case the chief justice will have to call for a larger bench 13 judges and that was the maximum that ever sat in the indian supreme court as one court with 13 judges when important constitutional issues where diverse opinions have come we have uh, 21 high courts in this country that means at the state level the highest court is the high court you will be seeing one of that court supreme court and then below high court which is at the apex of each state and these 21 high courts we have in all around 760 high court judges so 30 supreme court judges 760 high court judges and the district and the trial courts we have nearly 14000 judges in the district and trial courts so in all how many judges in india it will be a figure around 16000 judges to serve a population of 1.2 billion people on an average every year indians file a little over 16 million cases civil and criminal included and these 16000 judges together will dispose of around 14 million cases every year huge number incomparable with america every judge in this country disposes of around 2500 cases every year on an average that means you have to write 2500 opinions judgments after having heard them that is the quantum of work that is being turned out because every year with 1 point uh, i mean 16 million cases filed and 14 million cases disposed of 2 million cases arrears pendency these have got accumulated and today we have 30 million cases pending some of them for sufficiently long period nobody knows so delay is inherent in indian justice system and how much of delay it can be as much as 15 years 12 years your matter is heard today could not be completed then it is adjourned for one year later is that big is a difficult issue unlike american judicial system we have not institutionalized 
mediation, arbitration and alternate dispute resolution methods. It has just started and lawyers are reluctant to refer it to mediation and all that. They want real justice only in adjudication. And that keeps on and we have two appeals for every civil matter, not every criminal matter, but every civil matter, minimum two appeals are provided. So it will go to the higher court and then to the second level appellate court, things like that. Our uh, police, well, uh, very inefficient. Uh, you will be looking into greater aspects of human rights in criminal justice. You will have uh, read various reports, media reports about atrocities and torture and other things happening in police stations custodial deaths. There are a lot of problems in criminal justice administration in India. Much of which is contributed by the investigative wing. We are told that there are two broad areas of work for the police. One is called the law and order maintenance. The other is investigation, prosecution of crimes. I am told not more than 5% of the police force is available for investigation. The rest are all law and order is some problem somewhere, everywhere. So they are all busy with that. Investigation is left to be delayed. And uh, so that is uh, police administration creating problems in criminal justice. Prison and corrections, well, slightly better. Legal aid is a fundamental right, though not spelt out in the constitution as such. Constitution has said equal justice, equal uh, uh, opportunity before court is everybody's right. Right to counsel is a fundamental right. In civil cases? Choice. Uh, in civil cases as well? Hmm? In, civil cases. in criminal cases, right to counsel. And if without a counsel, counsel if a criminal trial has happened, is null and void. So necessarily, every indigent client will have to be provided by the state with a counsel. And we have organized legal aid at every level of the judicial system funded by the, state, the government. And um, we have uh, legal aid in a, conceived in a broader context, not only giving a representation in court, it also includes legal literacy, it includes public interest litigation, it includes even law reform for the poor, part of legal aid. So legal aid is a very broad concept in India which has uh, several implications under the... Uh, let me just move to legal education. If you have some qu quick question, this is just a rough uh, some ideas being thrown. But if you have some questions on the judicial system or legal... Yes, sir. Um, I mean, in right. the U.S. we're starting to talk about a right to counsel in civil cases, especially in immigration cases that can lead to deportation, which is somewhat similar to criminal punishment. Is there a similar discussion happening? Yes, it is, uh, particularly with respect to the Bangladeshi immigrants into India. Mm -hmm. You know, in, uh, in the history of mankind, the largest number of immigrants which any country has received at any time is India. Mm -hmm. India has one, uh, one time a little over a million refugees from Bangladesh in India. But some of them have migrated. The difficulty is when Bengal was divided by the British and later by the partition by, uh, on the basis of religion. On the basis of religion, Bangladesh became part of Pakistan. And later on, when in the liberation thing, these migrants have come over to India. And uh, many of them did not return because they are the same culture like the Bengalis uh, of India and therefore they could easily merge with the Indian population. So today in Calcutta, I am told there are a million Bangladeshi refugees. Many of them are voting or contesting elections also, have all the state cards and everything. There is no way of identifying them and repatriating uh, to the there is a law passed that they shall not be regularized and made voters here. But the law could not be enforced. 
and the local people got irritated and they have made direct action against this how come you allow the citizens of a foreign country to come and occupy and big contest political elections and all that so it is illegal the state made its effort but cases have come to the supreme court then the rights equality rights are available for everybody right to equality is not only for citizens to every person so the supreme court had to unless you can prove that 10 years ago 15 years ago they have come from bangladesh they are bangladeshi citizens you cannot repatriate them so many of them got constitutionally contested cases legitimate right to be indians and this is keeping on because we have a porous border which is not like america and mexico even there lot of mexicans come into america here it is almost daily when i was working in calcutta i went to a college which is uh, <coughs> bordering bangladesh and india and uh, divided by the river so the students a substantial portion of the students are bangladeshi students who come by boat in the morning attend classes and go in the evening and i found that they have become so numerous that a bangladeshi got elected as the student union president of a college in india and that continued so this i found when i when visited that college for a union function you introduced that i go back in the evening but i come back in the morning but suppose if you decide not to go back in the evening that is the end of it so that is also there so this is a, a problem which will continue after all we were one country india pakistan bangladesh were one country arbitrarily we got divided we have to live with it we have no option for that unless and until we sit on around the table and decide let us form a federation of indo bangladesh uh, pakistan or afghanistan whatever you want to a confederation if you like that is the word isn't it not a federation a confederation okay any other question or comment i don't know whether it is of interest to you or i am just telling you stories like this so <laughs> all right let me talk to you something about legal education in india it was started uh, in 1857 to be precise is about 150 years ago the modern legal education was instituted uh, in uh, by the british in uh, calcutta bombay and madras three presidency towns where the british settlements were there they have started lecturing <coughs> on law and eventually the university was asked to conduct an examination few barristers who were there they used to come and give some lectures and then finally an examination they were allowed to practice but practice only in certain areas of litigation and not where the barristers alone were allowed to practice anyway that continued for a long time but the system of instruction in law in an organized fashion in a university setup and examining and licensing them started few years later we got a bar council set up by a resolution of the high court not by legislative process later on it became a legislation and the bar councils were set up entrusted with the responsibility to license people to practice to take sanad and practice as a legal practitioner so the bar council organized the law classes in a little more systematic fashion prescribed the subjects to be studied and the examination the the skills to be learned and then prescribed that well after this university degree you have to be an apprentice with a lawyer for an year thereafter the bar council will conduct an examination in certain procedural subjects and if you clear that you will be licensed to practice that was the way the system of legal education got evolved entirely under the control of the bar council of of different places rather than the legislature or any other state authority when the bar council became a statutory authority under the indian advocates act 1961 after india's independence they have become the sole uh, 
determinant. You know, it's quite unusual that I'm a university teacher, dean of a law school. I would not be able to decide what to teach because the bar council will tell me that you have to teach these 15 subjects if you have to give a law degree intended for joining the profession. So the university's autonomy to some extent was captured by the bar council and the university let it go like that. They did not challenge it. It took several years later when we challenged, when the National Law School was established, 1986, when we did not go by the bar council prescription and challenged them, you refuse registration for the graduates of the National Law School if you have the guts. But the National Law School was conceived by the Bar Council, so they could not do that. So we exercise that uh, status, unique status, to dictate to the Bar Council what ought to be taught for a good law degree. And so much so today, we have two types of legal education system. To become a lawyer, you can either have a basic degree after higher secondary school. A basic degree will be of three years duration you get a BA, BCom, BSc, whatever. And thereafter, you join a law college for another three years for LLB. And then you become a lawyer. That means six years after the higher secondary school. In 1985, a five-year integrated LLB program was started where you can get admission soon after your higher secondary school and put in five years in a law school where you will study economics, political science, sociology, integrated with law. Our object was to give legal instruction in the context of society. So social context education, interdisciplinary education, understanding law not only as a litigative tool or adjudicating instrument for dispute resolution, but as a policy instrument for social change. So we went in that program which became a resounding success with the result today 14 states in India have 14 national law schools. They are universities by themselves. They can design the course, declare, award the degree, teach the way they want. They have aut autonomy. So the national law schools which are law universities, totally independent will be able to design and teach in much better way than the three-year course where people and sometimes the instruction is part-time in the evenings, in the afternoons, whereas this is a residential full-time program. So naturally you will find qualitative difference in the level or competence of the students graduating from the two streams. But there are two streams of education. Much of it has been knowledge based, you know, at the cognitive level of learning. We didn't have the American case method, analytical skills and its development, nor the legal writing research skills being developed in our uh, LLB program. But somewhere in the 70s and 80s, we slowly introduced some of these uh, methods of uh, case method of learning law by developing uh, cases and materials, textbooks, training some teachers, some of them having been educated elsewhere and coming back. So today, most of the law schools adopt, at least in certain courses, the case method of law teaching. But the bulk of law education today is what I am doing, lecturing. Whether it communicates or not, we don't bother, nor the students bother. Whether they come to the class, that also is doubtful. If the lecture is interesting, they might come. Some of them might come, they attend or sleep. Either way, examination at the end, you can prepare some cheap guidebooks 